Hey, good afternoon. This is Bill Gross, the LA probate expert. And I have here today a colleague, a Rossi Dijit, but on the other side of the country, Zach Mazur. Matt, Zach, say hi. Good afternoon. And where we catch you today? You're in Florida, right? Yes, uh, in the Palm Beach market. Got it. And so give us a little background. How'd you get into real estate? And how'd you get into probate real estate specifically? So from the real estate standpoint, I was uh, running a lending team with HSBC for years, uh, went through the crash, went through the banking side of things and some clients pulled me over to the real estate because I was helping them with different transactions and not getting paid. And they felt that I had a natural niche and feel for the side of the business. So I've been on this side of business for about six years. I've been with the probate side for a little over four of that or right about four of that. And the probate side was just one of those niches that sounded very interesting, a little scary at first, you know, death, divorce tend to be real estate niches or needs. So that drew me in and then Chad and colleagues like yourself being as supportive as you have over the years and willing to share and give different tips and tricks have really transitioned into this being a major part of my business. Wow. Well, that's exciting to hear. And so you've been in for the last four years. What was the original impetus? It sounded interesting or was there, uh, you do a probate case that you decided to work on or what was the original impetus to get involved? So I was listening to a YouTube, I believe, and it had really hit home because my father passed in 2011 and it was a natural tie because from a real estate standpoint, you just think, oh, someone passed away. It processes, everybody figures it out. Well, until you go through it yourself. You don't realize that there's so many needs and troubles out there to navigate, whether it's even the trust process or the true probate process. And it really opened my eyes to what my clients were going through and things that, you know, I kind of took for granted, you know, that, Hey, they were just going to handle that. Why are they taking so long to get over to me? And all of those things are kind of how I built my business, doing small things for clients initially. And then when I really saw what the probate side was, those different pieces just come very naturally to me, you know, helping doing the extra small things, being very sensitive to people's needs, listening more than talking. Yeah. You know, I use an analogy of a chess clock. I used to play competitive chess. I don't know if you're familiar with the chess clock. And so you have a timer and your opponent has one and time runs, you make your move, then their time runs. And if you run out of time, you lose the game. I try to think of it as I want the other person talking more than me when they're talking. They think I'm smart when I'm talking, they assume I'm stupid. So, so when you decided to get into probate, what were some of the first steps you took and how did they work out? Is that, is it the path you're on now? Or do you try a couple of different angles before you found the right process? So it was a little bit of a process, just like most of the agents we hear on some of these calls, a little nervous to spend some money on these leads or training and different things like that. And one thing that I've learned in real estate is in order to grow your business, you have to invest in your business. If you're investing in it, you're kind of investing in your clients and your future success by planting those seeds. So I was watching the YouTube videos. I got involved with all the leads when Chad was there. Still, they've been tr a tremendous help. And then whether I'm on the calls or just listen to the recordings on YouTube afterwards, I try and listen to a call or two a week at minimum, even if it's just repeating some of the same things over and over until it gets really ingrained in my head. And that's allowed me to kind of fine tune my value proposition and how I open those calls mm. because it's not a traditional solicitation call. Right. So all the leads like me, that's where I started when Chad was coaching there and using their data. And so initially, did you mail, did you call, do you do both? What was the initial process and how's that changed over time? So I started with a mail, a piece of mail in the calls, a struggle that I've had, like a lot of agents is making all of the phone calls. I average right around 400 leads a month. Uh, wow. Yeah. Well, well, that's a lot. So is that Down just here. Palm Beach County or is that the Tri County? Yeah, just Palm Beach County. Wow. That's a lot. Cause LA County is about 500 a month total. And I know we're the largest, so you guys are pretty close. Wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of people retire and you know, yeah. this is kind of that, you know, yeah. demographic in that capital. But so the struggle has been, I do the mailer each month to the brand new leads. I generally send one mailer. I started with the traditional letters that they had. I revamped it a little bit to my letter. And I actually find that an eight and a half by 11 postcard with that same value actually works better for me than the traditional letter. It's basically the same details, just more bullet points. And then 
I try and make a call to everybody that first month. I follow up with the people that I've contacted, but in all honesty, I probably get to about right around 10% of the leads regularly, which is pretty sad. But at the same token, out of that 10%, I would say that I pull just shy of two deals a month from wow. those leads. If you were to blend it over an annual basis. Right. And you know, if you're have 400 leads, you call 40 and you're getting two deals, you know, there's a lot of people out there that need the help. And then we've analyzed some of the back data over 10% of those deals will go to a sale within that three to four month time frame down near us. Mm -hmm. What I found over the time period is you will have a couple of those people to get mad and offended, but for the most part, I would say 80, 90% of the calls that you make, they're actually pretty warm phone calls in that the people are more appreciative that you've reached out. They might not be ready, but they're appreciative that you're reaching out. It's not a ambulance chaser type call. You're on the calls regularly and I am too. And I hear people who assume that's what it's going to be like. And I always tell people, nobody likes a phone call from a telemarketer and they're going to be mad and hang up on them. Everybody loves a fellow community member who's calling to help them and listen to them. And you have to decide which one you are. If you're going to be the telemarketer, you get a lot of people hanging up on you. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're the community member offering to help, really, what are they be upset about? They may not need you. And if you don't hear that and persist, you know, you have a problem. But if you hear them and move on and maybe circle back in an appropriate time later, then you have a chance to work with them. So it sounds like you're right on. Would you describe West Palm probate market competitive? Really competitive. Do you have an idea of how many mailing pieces you think they're getting in a typical month? From what I'm told that eight to 10, eight to 11 pieces a month, from what I'm told, they get a lot of text messages. Yeah. I would say almost a hundred percent of the people I've talked to, they get a text message. It's that's been highly offensive to them. I would say to them, have you ever bought anything from anybody who text messaged you as an initial opening, right? You know, like my, I have a dental appointment tomorrow. And so my dentist, you know, sends me a text. I have a doctor's appointment and they send me a text reminder. Okay. That's nice. But if some dentist just texted me saying, hey, we'll cut the price of your dental work by whatever, I'm not going to do business with some stranger because he texted me that. And, and I don't know why agents don't understand that that just doesn't work. Well, I think it naturally in life, we want the easiest path. Yeah. And we're afraid to make those phone calls. I'll be yeah. one to say that I wouldn't necessarily say afraid, but I know that there's more out there, more people to help, more money to be made, different things like that. And I don't make as many calls as I should. I run a very busy business as is, but it could be a lot busier just by spending even just an extra hour a day, sure. you know, making the phone calls. But to get back to the text message piece, one of the things that I appreciate the most about yourself is you pride yourself on those phone calls and also just your tone of voice. Her tone of voice is perfect for reaching out to people because it's soft. Whenever we're on the Zooms, I can tell that you're there listening to what anybody on the team and our community is saying. Those things all translate extremely well to this business versus a text message. People don't know your tone. Yeah. People don't know that you're genuine. They automatically will assume that you're that ambulance chaser yeah. or yeah. You know, it's a solicitation versus if you make the call and you come from, I am Bill Gross or I am Zach Mazur, it's a huge difference because I'm not calling them as a realtor. And sometimes I'll do car title changes or walk them through different steps that we don't make a dollar on, Right. but it's part of the value to the community. So if you sign up and you're going to offer these services, if someone calls you and needs help with something, that's not something you get paid on, you help them out. You plant that seed for future you know, positive karma is the way I look at it. Right. It's tough to dislodge you when you're the ones helping them get something they need. You know, I'll put this out. I say this all the time. I've not met any real estate agent who's built their probate business on texts or voicemail drops. It wouldn't surprise me if there's one, but I'm not aware of them. If, if you're that guy or you know somebody that guy, send me a, a message on the Facebook group or, you know, I'm sure you know how to get a hold of me. I know every realtor is in, in Chanted by the prospect, and I don't know anybody who's made way doing that. Just not not one. So uh, good for you to make those phone calls. Initially, when I broke into the side of the business, I was nervous to talk to people about, you know, that, oh, they're going to get the secret sauce. But most people do not come from a patient standpoint where they're willing to walk this through the process. I've had plenty that are a 30-day turnaround and you have a listing. But I've also had some, I just had one recently that was a little over two years. Right. It's pretty amazing when you get that phone call and a lot of them are in that year, year and a half out where they'll call 
I always tell people this pitch, I'm here for you when you're ready, whether that's tomorrow, today, or whether that's five years from now, there's no rush on my end. I move at your pace and the clients that call back a year later, a little over two years later, it's an awesome phone call to get when you built value enough where people will call you two years later because they saved your contact information. Yeah, definitely. That's that those, that's where it becomes fun to be in real estate. And this is a lot of fun. So you must have some system for staying in touch with people that long. You can't just be phone calling them directly. What else do you do to maintain contact with the lead over a two-year period? We have a uh, CRM system set up and we have just transitioned it. We were using top producer via market leader and uh, we're transitioning into a global banker Moxie program. All of them have different strengths and weaknesses. I wouldn't say that one's necessarily better than the other. It's what you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do a seven email campaign that goes out and it starts every other week and then it kind of slows down. And then after that, they go to like their traditional holiday drip or market update type piece. And when we make those phone calls, if the person is not ready and they are unsure what they're going to do with the real estate, or if they indicate that they will be selling down the road. We always ask for an email address where we can send them just a thank you and stay in contact. And that to me has been a huge value because just slowing down and asking for that small piece allows us to stay in front of them at a very efficient, but also cost-effective setup. It doesn't really cost us much at all to do that. And you'll have some people that unsubscribe after a little while, but I would say that you'll see people that are opening the emails and checking those things out. And it, it just builds in for that time piece, that time dynamic, because you can't possibly call if you're getting 400 leads a month, you can't stay in contact with those people two years down the road, you know, no, with all of them, for sure. Yeah, no, with all of this, it's going to be possible at some point, the numbers become impossible along the way though. I'm sure you, in addition to working with purse representatives, executives, administrators, families that you also come across attorneys. Are there particular, do you have a strategy for marketing to attorneys or do you get them organically through your business? What's that look like? So mine comes from an organic standpoint. I haven't had a whole lot of success building those relationships just one-on-one, -on -one, but where I have had success and I've taken attorneys that have been very loyal to agents is showing them on a deal, how I walk their client from start to finish and I hold their hand, trying to remove as much off the attorney's plate. Yeah, I take the same standpoint as the actual personal representative or the trustee, whatever I can pull off your plate, I want to be able to do that for you. And from the attorney standpoint, whatever I can pull off their plate, I want to be able to do that. You know, if they're having a hard time getting paperwork in or different documents, I like to be able to do that. And then just staying on top of the docket over the years, I didn't realize how much access I had to the docket in reviewing different things yeah. and you can save your client money, a big value proposition that I have when I contact the client, I'll say attorneys typically are going to bill you for every contact, every reach out that you have. And what I can do versus you reaching out to the attorney every day or every few days for an update, I can keep an eye on the docket. When that update happens, I can share that. So you reach out to your attorney. And what I found actually is a couple of the attorneys will thank me for that yeah. because they don't necessarily want billable hours for responding to emails or texts or calls for, um, docket updates that just slows down their process right. and it's been a good value proposition for everybody. And that also builds your credibility with those attorneys, yeah. what they're looking at and kind of some of those details and sometimes even reaching out to a client and saying, the judge just asked for this and they'll send it over to the attorney and the attorney's like, how did you know? Just those small things. You know, one thing I coach agents who are looking to build a business with attorneys or in personal representatives is you know, every state's different and every county is a little different, but whatever your county has, be the master of that, right? I don't think there's anything on LA County probate that is online that I'm not aware of, whatever rules, whatever systems there are. And I think that you, you hit it right on the head. If you know the docket, you create such value for the family and or the attorney. It's of incalculable value. So it sounds great what you're doing. Let's talk to, for just one last, just to kind of wrap up towards it, to the agent who's starting out, he's bought the data, maybe he's done some mailing, he's done some phone calls, he's in the first 30 days. I, I tell agents, you got to commit to 90 days. You got to call all the leads in the right format, and it takes you time to get better on your skill 
and it takes time for the numbers to accumulate and it takes time for the seeds to germinate and come to be a crop. What would you say to the agents just starting out, they're a little frustrated, they've made phone calls, they're not getting what they see as a lead right away. They, they spend the money in the mailers, it's, you know, their first mailer's out, maybe their second mailer's going out. What would you say to them is, is, do you see that it takes certain time? Do you see those skills come over time? What would you say to encourage them to keep pushing at it? Yeah. So I was an agent. It took me right around that three month, maybe just a little over three months to get comfortable in that mindset in with my delivery on those things. So I actually would mentally prepare them for about six months in, but I will say that if you want a niche in your business, that's always going to be there. If you take care of people, you continue to plant those seeds, you could actually build your whole business off of this. You know, and I've, I've strictly thought of cutting the rest of my business out and just strictly doing probate it does make me a little bit nervous, but I do think that there is that much business and value there and sticking with it. I think that these calls, listen to the call, you know, spend a couple hours. Most of the calls are only about an hour. So, you know, listen to two calls a week, whether you're working out and just looking for something to do, going for a walk, morning coffee, different things like that invest in that part of the business, just like real estate. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's plenty of people out in our community that are willing to help. And I mean, right. people in our niche are helping clients and we're also willing to help each other. So don't be afraid to ask, you know, I've also partnered with a couple of agents. Yeah, I've tried the ISA type thing over this time, but a couple of agents who haven't been able to, you know, either pay for the leads or limited leads. They, we've partnered where they make some of the phone calls for me and we do a referral type setup. So, you know, using that creativity, there's a lot of people in our industry, in our little kind of network that will help guide the people that probably won't do it as if it's in your immediate Palm Beach County or that type of thing. But, um, stick with it. Each no gets you a little bit closer. One of the colleagues that I've been teaming with trying to learn the probate and she had a very rough phone call last week. And she was dialoguing that call actually with me this morning. And at the end of the day, she felt that that got her that much closer to connecting to that next deal because she did get roughed up on the call. And it just kind of gave her a perspective of where that family was coming from. Each piece is just a little bit of a building block to that next step in actually helping someone who does want the help. There's more people out there that don't know what they're doing and that need help and are a little defensive. And if you put out that genuine care, it'll come back to you. So I really appreciate your time today. Thank you for the insights. I think being able to open a little bit and show us what you're doing and what's being successful. You know, this call today is sponsored by Probate Mastery, which is a coaching program headed by Chad Corbett, my first probate coach and, and Zach's as well. And we have a call every week on Tuesdays at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. That's free. And then there's a Facebook group for the alumni of the coaching program where we get together and share as well. I also host Probate Weekly, which is on Thursdays at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, probateweekly.com. And then we have a probate experts group in the Facebook as well with questions. So feel free to reach out. Zach, if we want to reach you, reach out to you, maybe have a referral for a probate or real estate sale in the Palm Beach County area, what would the best way for them to contact you be? I would just say call or text. Um, the calls are always better. 561. 376-6389 is my cell phone and pretty much 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. seven days a week. I'm available to you. If I miss your call, I promise I'll call you back the same day if it's within those hours. Try to keep my family happy after the 8 p.m. Sure. And uh, I thank you very much, Bill, for having me on and appreciate all that you've taught and shared over the years. Thanks. Well, thanks so much. It's been a pleasure and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk soon. Thank you. Have a great day.